transmission line model. There's two things we're going to talk about in this video. The first thing is just introduce transmission lines and talk about them a little bit and the fields and the relation between the electromagnetics and voltage and current. From there, we're going to model a transmission line as if it was a little tiny circuit. So there'll be resistance, inductance, conductance, and capacitance associated with it. And we'll derive that. And that'll be it for this video. Introduction. Let's start with this map of waveguides. And I've tried to capture all types of waveguides here, although I'm sure I am missing something. Transmission lines are absolutely waveguides. We tend to forget about that for some pretty good reasons, but they're absolutely waveguides in every sense. Usually when somebody says the word waveguide, they're talking about the types of waveguides that are not transmission lines. And I will use that a lot. I know that's confusing because waveguide really is the overall term here, but I'm going to do that simply because that's how it's used uh, everywhere else in the world. So we're going to not focus right now on waveguides or the set of waveguides that are not transmission lines and just focus on transmission lines. So one of the reasons that we seem to forget that transmission lines are waveguides is because they work all the way down to DC. And the cutoff where these higher order modes would exist is at such a high frequency that often it's not even close to where we're working. And the, the properties of waveguides in terms of the higher order modes just aren't something we consider. And we tend to think of these more as just a circuit element. But to be a transmission line, it has to have two or more conductors. And so to remember this, think of electricity. There's a plus and a minus. You have to have two wires. So two or more conductors to be a transmission line. Because of that, there is no cutoff frequency. We can operate these all the way down to DC. Now, I like to think of transmission lines as essentially being this two by two matrix or four broad categories that we could put them into or really two different ways to categorize that then we distribute into this matrix of four different types. So we'll start with this first row and we'll have what are called single ended or unbalanced lines. So this is a transmission line that has an obvious ground and an obvious signal line. And so they're kind of asymmetric that way. So think of like a coaxial cable, the big outer shell, that's the ground, then you have a signal line. On a circuit substrate, a trace going across the surface is actually a microstrip transmission line. There's a big ground plane on the back and a single little signal line. And there's coplanar waveguides, there's strip lines. A strip line is really a microstrip that has sort of dive down to a buried layer so it's between ground planes and it really is a different line at that point but it's still a, a circuit trace embedded in a circuit board the bottom row are the differential types so differential there's sort of two equal conductors and there's a there's a plus and a minus it's symmetric in that way uh, you could have coplanar strips there are even coaxes if you will that have two signal wires in here. And so that's a balanced line. There's a plus and a minus, but looking at these two lines here, there's not a clear one that one of them is ground, one of them is signal. They're both signals. It's a plus and a minus. And then the, the slot line is very common as well. Now, if we look at the first column and the second column, we can think of these as homogeneous and inhomogeneous. If the dielectric fill is homogeneous, it'll turn out that will simplify our analysis later on when we start analyzing these rigorously, whereas the inhomogeneous are a bit more complicated. And sometimes it can be hard to tell the difference. Like for example, we're looking at the microstrip here. Well, isn't that a nice homogeneous dielectric? How on earth is that inhomogeneous? Well, think about the electric field lines. They might start on the signal line, they go up into the air and then down to the ground plane. And so they, they penetrate air and dielectric. So those fields are experiencing two different dielectrics, air and then the actual dielectric of the substrate. Whereas if you think of the strip line or the coax, the fields are completely contained within the dielectric. They don't see air or any other type of dielectric. 
And so we will much prefer to be analyzing these homogeneous lines as the inhomogeneous ones become a little bit more difficult. We can look at the signals. Here we're looking at the electric field on a coaxial line as there's a signal propagating down the line. It's sort of going from lower left to upper right. And this is a relatively complicated electromagnetic problem. And to solve it rigorously, we actually have to solve it electromagnetically. But a neat thing we're going to do later is reduce transmission lines. And in fact, all transmission lines, we can reduce down to just looking at the voltage and current on the line. And that lets us sort of squint our eyes and uh, not really see the electromagnetic aspects directly. Instead, we're looking at it in a simplified picture of voltage and current. So this is a coax line. And then the next thing we'll look at is a twisted pair. And while I'm not showing the twist here, I'm just looking at two parallel wires. You can see the field is very intense between those lines. Uh, but otherwise, we can watch the, the wave energy propagate lower left to upper right down this line. And so already, even though we're looking at two very different types of transmission lines, um, if you kind of squint your eyes, they're starting to look pretty similar. And in fact, we'll show you through this transmission line model that any type of transmission line, once we figured out the certain set of parameters, they're all treated the same and they all behave the same. Well, they have different parameters, so they behave differently in that regard. But the fact that we can reduce it down to putting numbers to the set of parameters unifies all the transmission lines and we don't really have to care anymore whether it's a coax or a microstrip. If we just know these sets of parameters, we don't have to know anything else about the line. Pretty cool. So let's talk about what's called the RLGC model of a transmission line. And that's what we'll use throughout this course. So here I'm showing two different copper wires and I'm fading in and out here of a circuit model that we'll definitely be talking more about and the transmission line. And so this transmission line acts like a smearing, if you will, of resistance and inductance and capacitance. And we're going to look at it as if it's discrete little circuit elements. But in fact, that's not true. It, the resistance is smeared and continuous along the line. So is the inductance. So is the capacitance. But it will, we will treat it as discrete elements. We'll just make the size of those elements very, very small. So I think this is a useful way to think about transmission lines. And we'll be talking a lot more about this. Let's first think about the wires in the transmission line first. And so, yeah, we can think of this as just two parallel wires, but uh, you'll see how this is really a generalization to any type of transmission line. But since they're made of metals and there's no perfect metal, all metals have some amount of resistivity or conductance associated with them. And so we'll end up modeling that as a series resistance. And even though I'm showing this as discrete resistors here, it's really a smooth, continuous smearing of this distributed resistance. Now, there will be currents going down these conductors. Those currents generate magnetic fields. Those magnetic fields will be storing magnetic energy, acting like an inductor, not just acting like an inductor, but actually being an inductor. And we'll be modeling that with series inductors. And as I keep mentioning, I'm showing these as discrete inductors, but in fact, it's a smooth, continuous smearing of inductors. And it's the same for both lines. Each has this distributed resistance and distributed inductance. We'll eventually group these together into a single series resistance and single series inductance. Now those wires are also separated by some kind of dielectric, although that dielectric could be air. And no dielectric is perfectly insulating. It will conduct some amount of electricity. And we can show that as a shunt resistor here or a shunt conductance. I'm showing discrete resistors here, but it's really a smooth, continuous smearing of conductance from one line to the other. A transmission line, since it's two wires, essentially in parallel, that is forming a capacitor. 
and I'm showing discrete capacitors, but it's one big long capacitor, if you will. And so that's distributed capacitance and distributed conductance. So the distributed conductance has to do with the resistivity or conductivity of the dielectric that's separating the conductors. And the capacitance is just due to, we have two parallel conductors here. They have different voltages. They will establish electric fields. Those electric fields store electric energy. That is capacitance. Now a transmission line will have both of these at the same time. So let's overlap them. Now let's just clean things up a little bit. And we're looking at our series resistance, series inductance, and then our shunt resistance and shunt capacitance. We can focus our attention on one little group of those. Notice this group of parts repeats itself. And this is the beginning or the origin of how we're going to model this transmission line. We're going to analyze this one little repetition and then eventually make its size go to zero. So let's focus on this. Now let's give it a driving source. So when we drive this with a source, that will have some voltage and it will have some internal impedance to that source. Now, when we're analyzing this, and if we only care what this circuit looks like from the outside, so this source only cares about the voltage that it sees and the current that it's driving through this. When that is the case, we can combine these two series resistors and the two series inductors to just come up with a single element. And once we do that, then we can also ignore the driving source. And this is a very good model if we're not interested in exactly what the voltages and currents are internally here, just how things are working from the outside of this box. So this is the RLGC circuit model, and I'm showing kind of a freeze frame of this original thing that we showed that faded in and out between this transmission line and this circuit model. And what we're looking at is one small section of this line. And it may seem weird at first, a transmission line is a smooth, continuous thing, and now we're modeling it with discrete circuit elements. But what we're going to do is we're going to take the length of this and look at the limit as this goes to zero. The reason that this circuit model, if it were large, would not really model well that transmission line is because, well, we have a wave going down this line, right? And if it's high enough frequency, the voltage will actually be varying across this circuit, right? So in the bottom here, even though we have this continuous conductor and we would think, oh, voltage must be constant across this, well, if there's a wave going across our transmission line, the voltage would actually change across this line, and that would just throw off all the circuit theory we'd want to do here. So we need this circuit model very small compared to the wavelength in order to apply traditional circuit theory. So when we take this limit as it goes to zero, well, that's probably the best thing we could do. And so that's exactly what we'll do and how we apply the circuit model. So think of this as just being very, very small compared to the wavelength so that voltage is not really changing at all over the length of the circuit model. So when we've combined the resistances and inductances into single components, we call this the L-type circuit model, I guess because it's sort of forming an L here. So let's look one at a time. First, the series resistance. The first thing to remember though, even though we're writing this as a lumped element, we're really talking about a distributed resistance. So this R variable associated with transmission lines is a distributed resistance. That means it has units of ohms per meter. So if I am going to model this as a single lumped element, which would have units of ohms, I'm going to have to multiply by some kind of length. And so I'm going to multiply it by the length of this circuit model, right? Because this is truly a distributed resistance. It's the length of this whole circuit model. So R times delta Z gives us units of ohms, and it's a single 
resistance element at that point. And so this series resistance is due to the resistivity of the metals in the transmission line. Now let's move on to the distributed inductance. So it's not a lumped element. It truly is distributed across this whole thing, but we want to write it as a single lumped element. Now, since it is a distributed inductance, L is a distributed inductance, it has units of Henry's per meter. Well, since we want to write this as a lumped circuit element, we have to multiply by some kind of length. Well, we multiply by the delta Z again. So that lets us write it as a single inductor. There's a distributed inductance because there's a current flowing through this line. That current will generate a magnetic field circulating around it, which stores magnetic energy, which gives it inductance. Now let's go on to the shunt resistance or shunt conductance between the two lines. So the two lines are probably held in place with some kind of dielectric. Things like Teflon are very common. And those aren't perfect insulators. They do conduct a very tiny bit. This is a distributed conductance. So it's smeared smooth and continuous across the line. So it has units of one over ohm meters or sometimes written as Siemens per meter, the Siemens being the upside down ohm symbol. Now to write this as a lumped element, we will multiply it by the length delta Z again. So G times delta Z is this lumped conductance, if you will. It's a lumped conductor. Now, one thing to remember, we have two kind of resistances conductances here. We have an R associated with the line and a G associated with the line, a resistance and a conductance. These are not reciprocals of each other. Their units are, but these are representing physically different things, right? The series resistance is representing really the resistivity of the metals, and the G is representing the conductivity of the dielectric between them. So they are separate, different circuit elements in this model, if you will. They're not equal to each or inverses of each other. So don't think that way. Only their units are inverses of each other. Then last, we have a distributed capacitance. It is distributed, so it has units of farads per meter. Well, to write it as a lumped element, we'll multiply by the length of this model, delta Z, and now we have a lumped capacitor. We have a distributed capacitance because we have two wires here in parallel. They'll have voltages across them, so we'll have an electric field pointing from wire to wire that stores electric energy, that is capacitance. Now in transmission lines, there's a really neat relationship between the electromagnetic parameters and these properties we just talked about, RLGC. Now one assumption here that makes this exact is that we have a homogeneous fill. If it's inhomogeneous, we can apply similar things, but it's more of an averaging, it gets more complicated. When we have a homogeneous fill, it turns out the mu times epsilon, the permeability and permittivity of this dielectric medium is equal to the distributed inductance times distributed capacitance. And so that will be an exact relation. Also, the distributed conductance divided by the distributed capacitance is the conductivity divided by permittivity. So that's another exact relation there. And so it's neat that there's this tie between the electromagnetic parameters and the circuit parameters. And this is one of the things that's going to let us analyze this much more simply, just in terms of a voltage and current than having to do all the electric field analysis and magnetic field analysis and dealing with vectors and all that. It simplifies things very much for us. So here's some common types of transmission lines, right? We got twisted pairs, um, used to be used for phones all the time, coax cables and a microstrip transmission line. And so I've provided here some very representative values of the RLGC and we haven't talked about it a whole lot yet, but the characteristic impedance of the line. And notice that despite these transmission lines looking very different, their RLGC parameters are surprisingly consistent. I think that's pretty cool and amazing. And so all 
types of transmission lines, no matter what, we can fit this RLGC model to it. Now, I imagine there's complicated transmission lines out there that have diodes and other nonlinear things. And so, of course, this this model would not be able to handle that. But uh, almost all practical transmission lines of interest, we're going to be able to fit an RLGC model to. Now, determining RLG and C, and then characteristic impedance from those, but the RLGC are the fundamental parameters. Think of these as like mu, epsilon, and conductivity for fields requires an electromagnetic analysis to get these. But once we have R, L, G, and C, all transmission lines are analyzed identically and we no longer have to know what the transmission line was. Once I have R, L, G, C, I don't care whether it's a coax or microstrip, I can start analyzing and designing things with that. So determining an R, L, G, C, if you, followed me in previous lectures. We finished electrostatics actually by calculating the distributed capacitance of a coaxial transmission line. We didn't just calculate it, we derived it doing an electrostatic analysis. And we ended up with this equation. Now we hadn't talked about transmission lines yet or even really waves, so there wasn't a whole lot we could do with that. But we did derive a distributed capacitance. We did a similar analysis at the end of magnetostatics, and we derived a distributed inductance. Well, once we have the distributed inductance and the distributed capacitance, we can tie these together to calculate what's called the characteristic impedance of a transmission line. And this will become a hugely useful parameter, and it's equivalent to the impedance of a, of a medium that we had from Maxwell's equations when we were talking about waves, and it will relate the amplitude and phase of voltage and current at a single point along the line. And what we'll see, interpreting the meaning of the impedance is not so much that low impedance means one thing and high impedance means another. What we'll see is when the transmission line changes its impedance, at that discontinuity, we'll get reflections. And we usually don't want reflections because we want to get all of our power to a device, but sometimes we do. We want to do filtering or other types of effects. So the impedance will have a lot of meaning, particularly when it changes its value along the length of the line. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for using EMPossible. I want to create more videos and I want to continue to improve how electromagnetics and computation is taught online. To do that, it will really help me if you can like this video and subscribe to our channel. I also want you to know we have a lot more content that you may not be aware of. See everything we have to offer at eimpossible.net.